I knew many um, activist families. And I began to see, um, I was still fairly young myself, but I had my children were small, that if you were the child of such families, and I can think at once of two or three, um, you were brought up in an atmosphere where the struggle came first, and, the, and you as a child, a young boy or girl, you came second. And indeed, you were groomed, so to speak, politically groomed into the struggle. And I wondered and wondered, knowing many of them, how they felt about it. So I, how should I put it? I put myself into that position to see, and uh, that's how it came about. Um. And I also waited a long time to do it, because I thought, I am not in this. I'm neither a parent nor a child. I'm waiting for somebody to write it, who would know more about it than I did. Nobody did, so I did. <laughs> and it's only later that uh, some of those the children who were part of that grew up and wrote it. But um, I, I, was, I, I did it in the way I've described. I knew Burger's Daughter would be banned, because I even put in it um, the, the, uh, the movement, sometimes scattered uh, little pamphlets in the street, you know, which were swept up. But I always picked these things up. And I think I put one in almost in its entirety in the book. So that would be enough for it to be banned. But, you know, you couldn't, what, what else could you do? If you were a writer, you must write what you see and what you know and what you've come to know and what's happening around you. Mm. I uh, did something that nobody else had done, because I forget which book of mine, I think it was a, it might have been the late bourgeois world, or was it Burger's daughter? No. Um, I then asked the, the censors, the censorship board, the reasons. And of course, I'd consulted with my lawyer friends whether I was entitled to this. And indeed, it turned out that within, I don't know, two weeks or something of the banning order, you could apply. But if it was any later, so I did it very quickly. And I got the the uh, the the the, the um, opinions of these people on the why the book was banned, and indeed then uh, I had a friend at the University of Advertisement, an Afrikaner lecturer there, but he and other friends were uh, doing a little secret kind of little publishing venture of uh, anti-apartheid literature. And to do this as an Afrikaner was not easy, believe me, even less easy than for, for the rest of us. And um, we talked about it, and they agreed, I think he may have even suggested it, that um, I should write what happened, and quote, which I did. And there's this little booklet which is called um, What Happened to Burger's Daughter. So it was Burger's Daughter, yes. And it was then printed, they did it, and it was given to bookshops to give away free to people who bought books there. So it was the only way of distributing it. We felt, who are these people who are banning our books? And remember, I had got the reasons, yes. And one of the reasons was that, um, that a child um, is going around a church and there are pictures, you might have remembered if you've ever read the book, there are, there's the usual um, Christ on the, on, the, on the cross, and here he was dark, dark hair or something. And the child said, no, that's not Jesus, you know, Jesus has got, has got blonde hair and so on. And so the parents who were taking it around said, you know, this was in the Middle East, and it's very likely indeed that, that he was very dark. So um, not blue-eyed and blonde at all. And this was blasphemous, for God's sake. Or any, any, all in any of the gods. <laughs>
He said, and this is engraved somewhere in me, the day that I am no more than a writer, I shall no longer write. Because you can't be just living in an ivory tower. This doesn't mean to say that you write propaganda. That is for, it's a, a task with people who work directly in po politics. And indeed, for a writer to begin to be a propagandist is death of the, the talent that that writer has. But you are not only a writer, you're also a human being living among your fellow human beings in your society, in your country. You're enclosed by the laws of that country. You're enclosed by the, the mores and attitudes of the people around you. Uh, you have to be in relation to that as well. Take your responsibility of being a human being in a human society. I was born in a little gold mining town called Springs. There was no spring around. I don't know why it was called that. Um, and I spent my school days there. You know, I grew up there. My mother went to um, a dancing exhibition of some friend of hers who was a dancing teacher. And there was a little girl there who danced beautifully and who was called Nadine. And she was pregnant and she decided that if she had a daughter again, because my elder sister was already there, she would call her Nadine. So that's how I got my name. <laughs> well, Nan was my mother and she came from England uh, as a child with her, with her parents. And um, but my father came from Latvia, from some tiny little village somewhere. Um, so they, were, they had very different backgrounds and they were very different people. <laughs> they were both Jews, but um, my mother um, was an agnostic and um, we never ever had any, any, my sister and I didn't have any education as Jewish children. My father used to go to synagogue on the occasions, you know, fasting and um, days like that, and to honour his parents and the anniversary of their deaths. But that was all. And I went to the convent of Our Lady of Mercy, a Catholic convent, and nobody tried to convert me to anything. <laughs> Catholic had nothing, you know, to do with them. Though that perhaps, if, we'd ha if I'd had a Jewish education, it would have meant something to me. And the fact that it was all white, you must remember that I was born into a society where there was no question of um, mixed uh, pupils at schools. But uh, I early on uh, began to realize how artificial our life was. And indeed, to think, well, I go to the school, of course it was all girls as well, and um, on Saturday, great time, pocket money, and off to the movies. No black could go to see a film. And I just, as a small child, presumed they didn't, were not interested and didn't like it. It was not for them. But the most important thing was that I was made by my mother a member of the children's library when I was six years old and became a great reader and very soon left the children's department and took what I liked from the, the adults. Um, and I realized later in my life, this was my education, really, because I became a great reader and I had the library. We were not rich, nobody could have bought enough books to satisfy my desire to read. Uh, if I'd been a black little girl, I couldn't have used that library. It was closed to black people, the municipal library. So there you are. I don't like this word inspire, and um, I think you have to find um, what wakes up, what is latent in you. You may admire someone else, but to inspire suggests that you want to emulate them or be like them. You cannot be like anybody else, not even uh, the great writer or the great actress or that you that you happen to to admire. Um, I think that again I come back to books. My desire 
to understand life, to explore it, came through literature, through reading. And I always tell aspiring young writers, forget about creative writing classes. You can't teach people to write poetry or, or novels or, or short stories. You can teach them to be good journalists, that's another thing, but you cannot teach them literature in this way. And the only way you can teach yourself is to read, 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 not in order to emulate or copy what you read, but to become self-critical, to look then at your own little efforts and think, my God, look what this one and that one can do with a word that I haven't even touched yet. I wish only one thing, and that is that I had learned an African languages. We have 11 languages in South Africa. And of course, we were taught as whites, only English and Afrikaans, but not an African language. And, but I reproach myself now, because why didn't I learn one when I grew up? But by then, of course, any excuse, I was concentrating, as a writer must, on the language that he or she is writing in. But I still, that is my great regret, that I did not learn an African language and that I did not see to it that I learned when I was adult. Mm. Well, it was amazing because in the children's library they were obvious. My generation, it was Dr. Doolittle, Hugh Loftings, that your generation wouldn't have heard of, though I did pass it on to my children and their, and their children. Um, but as soon as I moved into the adult library, and my mother was a friend of the librarian who was a woman, so nobody stopped me. And then I read an amazing variety of things. Some history, um, some translations from Greek, you know, a bit of Sophocles and so on. And then my parents had um, friends whom they used to go every weekend to spend, I think, to play cards there. And um, I went along, and then I would be left in the alone in the, the man who was a lawyer in his study, and he had quite a good library. And it included the, of course, band Lady Chatterley's Lover. But I read Lady Chatterley's Lover when I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and there were many other books you know, of, that, of that nature. I think I used to mimic other people rather nastily, my mother's friends who came to, I don't know whether it was a book club or what it was. I would listen carefully and then I could reproduce for other people's amusement, <laughs> which wasn't a very nice thing to do. But I think quite a good training for a writer because as a writer you have to project yourself and indeed you have to use the vocabulary and the turn of phrase of characters who are very different from you. So this was a kind of training of, of this projection. Well, I think if you ask what the qualities of a writer are, you have to be born extremely observant. That is really the beginning of it. Because as Graham Greene notably said, when people asked, are your characters based on people? The answer is no, if you're a real writer, um, unless you choose a particular individual. You choose Napoleon and then you write a, a novel about his love life, you know, then you re recreate him. But in, in general, what um, Green said, and that I think is absolutely true and I found in my own life, he said, you are sitting in a bus, you're in a queue, uh, you're waiting to go in at the dentist's, and there are people there and you, first of all, you have to have big ears, you eavesdrop. You catch a word here and there, you see that there's a quarrel brewing perhaps in the restaurant and a love affair brewing somewhere else and um, a case where one dominates another. You see these people and you, and you read their body language and you create alternative lives for them. Obviously my parents got this Sunday paper and there was this large spread that was children's section and then they invited children to send things in. And I was already from the age of nine scribbling away. Um, and so I wrote a story. 
which had something to do with um, the rainbow and the, what was found at the end of the rainbow, and sent it in and it was published. But my first adult story was published when I was 15 in a, a liberal journal that was on at the time. And of course they didn't know that uh, this was written by a child. And what a great moment when, indeed it was November that year when I, the paper arrived and there was my story printed. And I was even paid for it. <laughs> That's a really exciting moment. It was a great moment, yes. Were your parents supportive? Were they supportive? Well, fortunately for me, um, I think I could have been ruined by being made a child prodigy. It was just, um, uh, you know, Nadine amusing herself. And at that time, until I was 11, um, I was a passionate, a passionate dancer at dancing class, yes. And of course I had the right build for it being very small and, and light. And um, my ambition was to be a dancer. And I wasn't bad, but um, fortunately for me, I changed ambitions and uh, I would have been really over and done with long ago now. <laughs> I had some very common uh, condition that I've discovered since, to do with the thyroid gland, which happens sometimes when you're on the brink of adolescence. Yes, you know, and all your glands are starting to, to uh, throb and come up. <laughs> and for reasons of, uh, that I shouldn't go into my mother's marriage and so on, she clung very much to her children and she made a tremendous thing of this. And um, the first thing I was made to give up was the dancing, mm. which was a, a great deprivation for me. <laughs> That was the experience that led to one of my very first stories, yes, in fact, I think the second or third adult story. And not only that, it led to my understanding of how we were living as privileged whites, even though we were not rich, um, compared with um, what the real situation was in the country. Because indeed, in the middle of the night, um, there was a, a row going on in our yard of our house, and um, my parents and I got up. My sister was, all, had, was already um, left, left home. I think she was married or something. She, she, she was at university. She became a teacher. And um, we, were, we went out, and there was the woman who worked for us and who, you know, knew so very well the old um, American South situation, you know. Here was white mama and black mama. So black mama, they had rifled her, her room, they had turned her mattress over, they were looking for illegally brewed beer. And of course there was a lot of illegal brewing around. I don't know whether if she, Letty her name was, whether Letty brewed, why, why should she not on the side? But fortunately there was nothing there that night. But everything was thrown out all over the place, even outside the room into the yard. And we stood there, my parents and I, and the police were there. Black policemen, uh, under the, the, um, the uh, direction of a, a white policeman, doing all this. And my parents didn't say to the police, where's your, your warrant of getting into, you know, to come into the house and do this. I mean, they just walked into, into the property because they were doing the right thing. They were stopping, they were trying to stop people from, uh, black people from brewing. So I began to think about that afterwards and then to look at many other things in, the, in, the, in our life. I always compare a writer with an opera singer. If you're going to be an opera singer, you are born with certain vocal cords, which I imagine you don't have and I certainly don't have. Unless you have that, you can go to all you can all the training, up voice training in the world. You're not going to land up at La Scala, but if you have it, then you can develop it. Now, if you're going to be a writer, we have to go back to what I said before. You are born with certain um, 
characteristics. First of all, tremendous um, sense of observation, as I say, um, and a great curiosity about life. You're not prepared to take all the answers, you know. If you're a good girl, you'll go to heaven, and um, God is looking after you, and this, that, and the other, and you must listen to your teacher, and so on and so forth. So independence, an independent mind is like having these, these um, special chords if you're going to be an, an opera singer. That's really the, uh, the beginning of it. I had no idea how I was going to make a living. <laughs> and of course it was presumed in the circles in which I lived that when you finished school you would be a typist or um, indeed if I had gone on dancing I might have been a dancing teacher of, of children. And of course you got married and then you didn't work. That was the end of your working career. The idea that you, there were very few women doctors um, I didn't know a single woman, lo woman lawyer where I lived, you know, this all was not in our milieu. I decided much later, when I was about um, 19 and when I was already publishing here and there, um, and living at home and um, eating food provided by my father and so on, um, that I wanted to go to university. So I went to the University of Bratislava as an occasional student for one year, no degree. I mean, and of course it was interesting because it was just after the war, and um, th there was this big division. I was like the, the people who'd come back from the war, the soldiers, who then were you know adult, and in my case, I found that I had read far more than. Um, than, than either they had, because they hadn't had the opportunity, and also the, um, the, the younger ones who had just come from school. So, you know, what where they were recommended reading, I had already done out of my own, for my own pleasure and my own enlightenment. Mm. But what I did learn that year there was indeed, through one good lecturer, was to become, as I say, very self-critical, not just to uh, to, to think that whatever I had written was just what I wanted to say, but to see how it could have be, to be critical that it didn't. I saw then, began to see where I was failing. The University of Witwatersrand was a white university, but there were certain occasions when there was a subject that was not taught at a black university. And here and there, a black student would be accepted, usually a postgraduate. Now, through somebody there, um, and there were people connected who, who came from, back from the war, who were very um, against you know, the, the result of what they had fought for, freedom, and then you come back to another fascist country. Mm -hmm. You've just defeated one, now you come back to one which is your own. And one of my first friends, black friends, was the wonderful writer, Iskia Mpashlele. Zeke, as he was known then. Zeke and I met, I don't quite remember how, and we were both young writers, um, just wanting to, to teach ourselves how to write, and we started to exchange. He'd show me his story and I'd show me mine. Um, of course, his position was very different from mine because he was black. Mm -hmm. And um, it was then that I began, and along with others, to, I won't say defy, that sounds, to ignore, which is a form of, def very strong form of defiance, the uh, edict that black and white mustn't mix. So mixed parties, um, uh, going to a Shabin together and so on, that's really started for me then. And then I met many others, and especially people also in, in, in the theatre. Wonderful writer uh, uh, called Todd Machikiza, um, and a number of others whose names probably wouldn't mean anything to you. Yes, a great friend, the closest woman friend I've ever had, um, quite wonderful. From her too, 
I think I received a, a political education. She was of solid Afrikaner stock because that's a um, Huguenot name, Dutois. Mm. But here we called it Dutoy because it got naturally, um, I don't know, Afrikanerized. And Betty was a member of the Communist Party. She um, had been illegally married and then married somewhere else and came back to live here to uh, an, a prom an Indian family with a prominent Kachalia family. And um, she worked, she was in trade unions. And a matter of fact, she worked with, believe it or not, and was a sort of partner in the, at work, work wise with Albie's father, Sully Sachs. Yes, Garment Workers Union and this one and, and that one. Anyway, this was a world unknown to me with my little sheltered, although she was, of course, also white, and she'd been totally disowned by her, all her family because she was a traitor. Mm. We became great friends, and both my husband and I were really close to her because I happened to meet her um, as a young divorced woman. My first marriage was a failure. And um, I met Betty Detroit and my future husband then, Ronald Casera, on the same day in, in somebody's house, yes. And the three of us were very great friends, and both Ronald and I felt she was a, a guru in many ways because she was right in the thick of, the, of uh, you know, the whole thing. Now, of course, the time came when she was detained. She was in detention. Her family had abandoned her. All her comrades in the, in the movement, in the, in the ANC and in the South African Communist Party, dare not come forward and say, we want to visit her. And you were supposed to have family visits only. Anyway, it was no great courage on my part. It was just an obvious thing to do. I went to the, the police who had to go and said, I'm her sister and I want to see her. So they said, but you've got a different name. I said, of course, I'm married. I'm... And so I got permission to see her. And that meant I could go, in, go to the women's section of the old fort, which is now the famous Constitution Hill complex, part of that. Albie will have talked about it. And so I saw the inside of a prison for the first time, and to see, to see your friend there is quite extraordinary. All part of your education if you lived here. On a visit, then, I would be sitting here. There would be a heavy grill in front of me. She'd be brought in and she'd sit on the other side, and then we would talk through this with a, two warders looking at the watches and so on. Mm. But I think it was very fortunate for me that I had this experience. It, it made me understand the realities of where we were living. And so my, my um, involvement with and adherence to the liberation movement started. Mm. Oh, yes, indeed. I was introduced to him, my great good fortune, by the English journalist editor of Drum, Anthony Sampson, who was introduced to my husband to me and who became an, an intimate of the house, a great friend. And he was going, he was reporting um, that first trial in the, the drill hall here, and he took me along. And in the recess thing, I met Nelson Mandela, and so after that I was fortunate enough indeed to, to get to know him. I was there the day when he came out, saw him come out of the prison in, yes, I was with Anthony Sampson, and then I saw him alone after that. Um, when he was in prison indeed, he, among the people he asked to see, he asked to see me, and I applied and I was refused. They wouldn't let me see him in, uh, in, uh, on the island. So, uh, but I was one among a number of people who refused. So, um, indeed, oddly enough, somebody had smuggled in Berger's daughter, and he read Berger's daughter, and then he, he asked to see me. And so I was absolutely delighted, and it was ready to hop on a plane and go to Cape Town and go to the island, but as I say, I had to apply, and the answer was no. I have been surprised that this book got more attention and has lived longer than that. And I haven't always agreed with it. I thought, no, well, why is, is, is that one favourite? For instance, a book of mine called July's People Never Dies. 
and it's taught in schools and so on. But I suppose that has certain reasons because it was the only book that I've written, novel I've written, which had some, something frightfully prophetic in it. It was written at a time when we were, you know, like the swine wait, waiting to throw ourselves over the, the, the precipice into a terrible civil war. And it could so easily have happened. So what is told in a personal way in a family, in microcosm, what happens in that book, seemed to catch people so that they, they would think, this is, I'm now I'm presuming, oh my God, you know, this so very nearly happened to us. So it, it's taught in schools all the time, which amazes me too. But perhaps it's good because it reminds them what, what they've come from, what their parents lived in. Mm. I would have thought Berger's daughter or the conservationist, but you see, the conservationist, I haven't got a crystal ball, but the conservationist, when you think how much land, the question of land has come up, so that now old book was about land. Six, six feet, the grave, was all that, the, that a black man had. But that goes way back to my first, my second book of stories, <coughs> which was called Six Feet of the Country, and also was the matter of a burial of a black man. No, I can't understand why anyone should look, in, look at themselves in this way. <clears throat> then I suppose I should have said, I mean, the, the climax of it would be the Nobel Prize. But when I think of, right, the Nobel Prize, it was very wonderful indeed. But when I think of what we talked about before, that first story in an adult paper arising out of the raid on the house. I was 15 years old. I picked up the paper. That was the, an a tremendous thrill, you know. Because <laughs> once you, when you grow older and other fortunate enough to have good experiences with your work, um, it wouldn't be, have quite the impact that that 15-year-old uh, one had when I was 15, not 15 years ago. Mm. It happened to be that um, my husband and I were visiting our son in New York, and I got up early, tiptoed through the house to the kitchen to, because of the time change and so on, to phone somebody that I wanted to speak to urgently in England. But when I got there, to my amazement, the phone rang. And I picked it up and it was to tell me that I... <laughs> because what happens is this, you know, when you get on the list, it goes on for years. And the last the two or three years before that, at least two years before that, journalists would phone me and say, you know, you're, you're on the top list, you're one of two people up there. And how do you feel about getting a Nobel Prize? And I would say, if I ever get it, I will tell you goodbye and put down the phone, which is the only way to deal with it. Um, of course, one of the nice things about getting a Nobel Prize um, is, first of all, it gives you a voice with uh, certain causes that you may be very, uh, very um, not keen on, that you are attached to and enthusiastic about, people will listen to you now, you know. And um, also, of course, you have to learn to say thanks but no thanks, because people don't quite remember what you got the prize for. They think you've got it for physics or peace or something, or something. and so you get invited to come and speak somewhere. I mean, it's not in your field at all, but okay, that, that doesn't, doesn't really matter. But one of the perks, I would say, is that after that, you have the privilege every year of this time of the year now, just about to do it again next month, of sending very secretly your nominations, who you think should get it next time. I think that's a very good idea. They ask those of us who, who have it. Now, I, as I got it in 91, that's a long time ago, isn't it? And I have done this faithfully every year. I've only had two successes when I coincided with, obviously, others. The one was the Japanese writer, Kenzaburo Oe, wonderful writer, and Gunter Grass. I could never understand why they hadn't got it before, but they hadn't. 
So I was absolutely delighted. But um, other times, for the rest of the time, I have not had success. <laughs> but I keep on. I can't remember who it was who called from England. Yes, it must have been a reporter, yes, from, uh, from England. So then I went back to my bedroom and shook my husband and said, he woke up and he said, what is it? I said, I've got the Nobel Prize. He said, absolutely. Of course, we then had a celebratory breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but when I came back here, that was wonderful because my friends in the ANC of course, I was a member of the ANC for a long time then already. And um, my writer friends, especially my writer friends, um, came to the airport and uh, someone blew the, the ceremonial horn, you know, the one that has now become a sort of trumpet for sports things, but blew that and then they gave me a, a wonderful party afterwards. And um, the... The speech at the party was made by no, no less a person than Walter Sisulu. So that was absolutely marvellous. Because mm. I was fortunate, you see. People always said, ah, the, the Nobel Prize is death to you as a writer because you, you, you feel afterwards, oh, I must write a book good enough to... But fortunately for me, I was in the middle of writing um, uh, my son's story. So I just went back to my book and forgot about that. It didn't inhibit me. It, new Nobel Prize isn't going to make your writing any better or any worse. If you let, let it uh, uh, stifle you because you're afraid that the next book won't be so good, you know, so what? Oh, yes, and it was down here at the... the it was in the church. Oh, that became our painting. That was unforgettable because there you were with... You know, there are all the apartments, flats round about, and the people, the workers there, who were called flat boys at the time, and all wore little pants with a red stripe and so on, little white shorts, that was the outfit. And they still wore that then. And there they were, among everybody else, you know, the, the, the residents of Parktown, of Hillbrow, of all, the whole area around which we lived, and it was simply wonderful. Mm. I hadn't voted the last time, the time for, because there was nobody for me to vote for. You know, I mean, there was um, I was in I was in the party. I was in the ANC, and um, I, I I didn't feel that I could want to put anybody into Parliament who uh, was offered. Then, mm. not as I'm not talking about them as individuals. I'm talking about the the parties that they represented. I am often um, getting into trouble with feminists because I don't belong to feminist organisations. And um, my, I'm indeed a feminist as I am um, a humanist. I believe that everybody should have the same rights, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're any mixture, whether you're male or, or female. Um, and obviously women have been a hammered have been and are still very much, uh, um, how shall I put it, deprived of their full rights, many of them. So naturally, I'm on that side, people who, women should be paid the same as men, they should have the same opportunities, uh, all these things. They should have the same authority in, in their family, in, in all kinds of decisions. And insofar as that's concerned, I am indeed, I'm a woman, therefore I'm a, I'm a, a feminist. When it comes to the arts, I have a different, different view. For instance, the idea that there are associations of women writers. To put it quite bluntly, you do not write with your genitals. You write with what's up here. So why must there be this distinction? You don't have associations of men writers. God knows it's coming, I'm sure. We we'll certainly have associations of homosexual writers, lesbian writers, then it'll be writers with blue eyes or writers with black eyes. You know, when is it going to stop? We all are writers and we, may, we are influenced perhaps by our sex, which is so interesting, and especially since for, for 
millennia for recorded time, they've had different roles. When you think that now we've got women, uh, for even from the last from the last big war, women in war, um, we have women pilots now, we have women presidents in some in Germany and so on, you know. Um, but this is on the ability, which has been denied for too long, and which I think was inferior to that of men, because look how women were kept at home and not allowed to, to follow their, their educational uh, talents and so on, the ed educational possibilities. So, you know, we've had to come through all that, and I'm all for it, just as I am for blacks or for anything. Anything involving race, colour, sex. Hard enough to be human without dividing it up that way. Sometimes a story occurs to me, and a story is like an egg. It's complete. There's the shell, the white, and the yolk. When our short story comes to me complete, the beginning, the end, and you know, and, and, and how I'm going to get there. A novel is different. A novel, I always know the beginning, and I think I know the end, and then it goes in stages, it develops. I do not have it complete at the beginning. Theme I have, yes. Characters, not all of them, others may come along as I'm writing. So it's a completely different thing. Often, when I'm writing a novel, occasionally an idea comes for a short story, I jot down it, two words or something, three or four words. And maybe when the novel's finished. Uh, but I don't usually interrupt the novel to, to write a story. No. But both forms, they're very different, and both, uh, both appeal to me as something that I, I want to do. Mm. I don't live in an ivory tower. Um, I'm very concerned about AIDS, and although I know Tob and Becky, and I've respected him for many things he did, I've never understood, and I still don't understand, his attitude over AIDS, his disbelief of, of how it existed and where it came from. So now, what do you do? I'm not a politician. What can I do about AIDS? Talk about it as we are doing now, you know, tut tut. But then I thought, look what the musicians do, especially the jazz musicians. Look at these great gigs they were having everywhere. First of all, they made money for, the, for people who were supporting people who have AIDS or for prevention. And secondly, they were rousing people's attention to this. But I thought, what have we writers done? Um, for instance, the wonderful international organization to which I belong, PEN, many people don't know this, but they have been wonderful for several, two generations now, over writers who are in prison and um, taking care of their families and keeping in touch with them and uh, agitating to get them out and sometimes successful. But not a word about AIDS. Do writers consider, first of all, that this has got nothing to do with them. Has nobody who is a writer ever got AIDS? So I said, well, there's no good carrying on about this. Um, do something. I thought, well, OK, we can't have gigs, you know. We're not in that, haven't got that enormous uh, access to people. But what about a collection of of writings, which would not be about AIDS, but which would be attractive writings, which would make a lovely Christmas or birthday present, and the money would go to, I chose ours, the Treatment Action Campaign. So I wrote to writers, 20 writers, I think it is, yeah, no, 19, because I'm the 20th, and some of whom are my close friends, um, others I knew wrote really good stories, you know, not all novelists write good stories as well, but the ones that I chose indeed do, or did. A couple of them, alas, have died now. And um, told them, please, a story. Don't sit down and write something about 
people getting AIDS. I'll just choose one of your best stories, please, and send it to me. And I'm going to find a publisher for a book. And um, the stories will be collected there. And the proceeds, the royalties, will go indeed to, to the organization and organizations that uh, are dealing with people who have who are HIV positive and or, ha or have AIDS. I got a wonderful response. No refusal from anybody, which was really great. And um, then I thought, oh, now the stories are going to come. All the stories are absolutely outstanding. Um, I happen to have a couple of favorites among them, but they're all very good. And um, then I spoke to my own publishers and I sent the material to them. They agreed to publish, taking only uh, production costs and no share of any royalties. It's now in 15 languages worldwide. So in its small way, it doesn't do what a, a big gig does, but it has reached people and it has brought in quite a bit of money. If they're allowed to, by the natural feelings of resentment of blacks that the whites hogged everything for centuries, that there should indeed in time be no distinction at all. I'm not saying this necessarily has to come about because we've got a mix um, biologically, though I'm all for that as well. But um, we've got to stop but getting, stop looking at us as separate we, in, and not as South Africans. But as I always say to European friends and friends in America or anywhere, we have had only 15 years after centuries since 1652 when von Riebeck landed at the Cape. There's been racial prejudice and racial separation. How can it be fixed in 15 years? I'm not excusing the things that we're not doing, but I'm simply saying to these people, vis-a-vis -vis racism and class difference, have you achieved in several hundred years at least a, a real democracy? I don't think so. You've still got very poor people. You've still got prejudice in terms of, of race and religion and heaven knows what. I mean, religion is a tremendous division between people. I always used to quote the Scandinavian countries, but now it seems that they are, the Swedes are very concerned because they've got so many refugees who are not white. And so the whole business of difference comes up and it's mixed with economic opportunities and it's a very complex thing. But unless we can overcome it, uh, Right, then the, I don't know what will happen to whites, but if they should exist no more as white, uh, then there will come a time when, the, when blacks will, will feel what, what have we done. We either are all South Africans, and in a way I think we should drop the South. We are Africans if you're born and brought up in Africa, and if you indeed um, respond to um, the, the new South Africa. But when you get incidents like the Free State students, you just wonder. Hmm? The Free State students, when in, in um, 07, they held what was called an initiation ceremony, as I think often happens in, uh, among students, yes. But this consisted of inviting the cleaners, five cleaners in their hostel, black of course, Four, men and, four women and a man, to come and party with them. Now, you can imagine, how this must have seemed such a nice gesture from the, from the students. But what they did was, first of all, they made them drunk, then they made them dance for their amusement, and then they fed them food. And in the stew, one of the students had peed. He'd pissed into it, and they were forced to eat it. 
I mean, they didn't know that it happened, but when they tasted it, it tasted awful, and they spat it out, and they were told, come on. Now, this was at the, um, at the University of the Free State, traditionally an old um, Afrikaner stronghold, and these were a couple of, there were four young white men. This happened in 07, but the tape was only produced some months later. And you can imagine the shock then. We saw in the papers um, f uh, flashes from the, you know, excerpts from it, and saw this young man standing there doing this, and then these poor people. Now, the university principal when it was exposed like this, said, well, they'll come before disciplinary committee. Well, that dragged on and on, and we didn't know what happened. And it seems that one of them, one of the students, and I, I thought, how unfair, if they all watched, they were all equally brutal. Um, he, I think, either voluntarily left or was expelled. The others just continued. And what the disciplinary thing was going to be, we didn't know at all. But then the, um, I think it's human rights, they have just come into it very recently, this year, um, and have said that uh, indeed, which is true, there should be, um, they should come to the court of law because it was a criminal act under, under our constitution. So that's sort of hanging in the air. It hasn't come. These things get put off as they do, like our corruption trials. Um, but it, it was a tremendous shock. There are many ways to look at it. When you see the pictures of these young men, the white men, they look perfectly ordinary, um, rather nice face, nothing brutal looking about them. So what kind of upbringing did they have? What kind of terrible racist ethos was pressed into them by their parents? And I mean, and they are young. You know, they've, they've grown up since our country is supposed to have changed. So that was a bit of a shock to us all. Right, we hope it's an isolated incident, and certainly of such vulgarity and cruelty now, another point has come up. Who, until only two weeks ago, last week, who at all has um, talked to the, the four people, the four cleaners? What's happened to them? Are they being, the thing was, they must be con compensated. Well, they have spoken and said very well, but you, how can you compensate for what, is, for what happened to us? But of course, under our constitution, the, the lack of dignity counts. So all these things are now still to be dealt with. But it's so good that it, these things come up now, and then there well, may be a lot of argument about them, but that's part of dealing with them. I really can't think of any country, not in, in our time, and perhaps in any time, when violence hasn't been part. It's part of... Um, the, the, uh, the human state. It's, it's something, um, I mean, animals are, they are not violent. They kill, predators kill because they've got to eat. But we kill, only human beings kill um, in, in power positions. Whether it's a personal power position among lovers, if it's ambition, or if indeed it is politically motivated. So we are, I'm afraid, unique in that. But I think it is, how shall I put it, it's, it's endemic and it's very, very deep, it's congenital. Alas, alas, alas. Life is one experience after another, and it's, it's a mystery. As a writer, I would say that as writers, 
we're exploring the mystery, the mystery of existence. Not in the sense that philosophers do, but whether you're a painter or a writer, when I think of my friends who are painters, uh, in their way, they're doing it, in my way I am. And of course, in the practical, very practical sense, in the public sense, that is what people are doing in politics, when they achieve things in politics. And we've had some wonderful achievers, starting with Mandela, Albie Sachs, the extraordinary personality that has accepted all the things that have happened to him and, and never become bitter. So that I would call achievement, tremendous achievement. It's different in every field. If I have one, it's between the pages of books I've written.